Hi, thanks for joining us and welcome to the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Today we're having an herbal tea party featuring some interesting and tasty herbs, including some you may think of as weeds. And it's time to start planting our warm season vegetables. So Tom Mishu is here to help get us started. All of that and more is just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, so stay with us. This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Sherry McCullough. Sherry is the president of the Memphis Herb Society and Walter Battle is here. Walter is the director of the Haywood County Extension Office. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, happy Thank to be you. here. All right. Hi, Miss Sherry. Hey. Look at our table, Walter. Doesn't this look good? Oh, yes. Quite a spread. Yes. But look, before we get to talking about what we have here on the table, let's talk a little bit about the Memphis Herb Society since you are the president. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Yes. The Memphis Herb Society meets generally on the 4th Thursday of every month, except for maybe December. Okay. Um, it may change. Um, it starts at 7 o'clock. If you go to our website, memphisherbsociety.com, okay. um, okay. you can find out exactly when the date is and what the times are. Uh, we have a lot of good speakers. Okay. Um, we have people that talk on edibles and medicinals, so we run the whole gamut, as well as growing herbs. Okay. So it's been a fun experience for you being the president? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, my... Uh, statement is that you know if they didn't like me being there they can always volunteer and be the president uh, themselves. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it sounds good. And is it a pretty large society? Pretty uh, large we're, membership? We're about 130 oh, wow. folks or so. Wow. On an average 40 to 60 people show up at a meeting. So wow. we're, yeah. we're a nice wow. size, not as big as some of the other organizations, but we all like to cook and eat. So. I can deal with that. Well, look, so most people are familiar with a few herbs like parsley, dill, oregano, and things like that that they can find at their grocery store. But guess what? You can actually eat your weeds? Yes. Really? Yes. What better way to get revenge, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Um, the, um, one of my favorite ones is chickweed, okay. which is right here in front of me. Um, that's the one that kind of, it's running rampant and going to seed right now. Yes. It's called mm -hmm. Stellaria media. It means little star. The flowers look like mm -hmm. little tiny stars and they're all closed up now, so you can't see that on these. Uh, but it's a very nice green, fresh flavor. Um, I think, you know, those um, microgreens that are so mm -hmm. expensive in mm -hmm. the grocery stores, the satsui and stuff, yes. uh, and the little beets. This kind of has a slightly beet-like flavor to it, and I really don't like beets that strong. So, <laughs> you know, uh, but, but it's, it's green, right. and, um, you know, if you're willing to try. I'm willing. Hey, you're willing? Watch, are you willing? Yes, yeah. yes, I'll, I'll try it. Right break try. you off a piece. So we just break off a, uh -huh. break off a piece like that? Uh-huh. Okay and just chomp yeah, on it. Go. We just had the rain, so it's a, it's a little uh, watered down right now. Not bad. It's not bad at all. Not, not bad. bad. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. And it's, it's high in vitamin C, okay. calcium, potassium, phosphorus, iron, and zinc. Okay. Okay, you can also use it medicinally. It's great for hot, irritated skin rashes, like wow. uh, uh, diaper rash on okay. babies and infants, uh, uh, eczema. Mm. Uh, when I was gathering with this other herb we're going to talk about, uh, I managed to get stung and I wadded a whole handful up and rolled it around in my hands and it stopped the sting. So it's great against stinging nettles. Um, How about that? It's yeah. used in salves to heal wounds. Uh, so you can eat it, you can stir it, uh, cook it like uh, greens, okay. steam it, okay. you can put it in soups. Um, when I said it was gentle, you know, you have to bear in mind it's a food, okay? okay? okay. Sure. And it's like a strawberry. 
Okay. We don't think of strawberries as being bad, but if you're allergic to them, they're a bad thing. So okay. what you can do is take and crush some up and place it on the inside of your elbow in this soft spot right here, just a little test mm. patch. You can do this with anything. Okay. You want to do it with lotions, anything, chemicals, anything you're going to do with your body. Do a little test patch and wait and see if anything, if you get a rash or anything. Okay. If so, oh. discontinue use. Okay. That being said, um, okay. so... Okay. Let's talk about our dandelion. Uh, the dandelions, um, they're very good. The whole plant is edible, the flowers, the roots, and the leaves. Wow, the whole plant. And did, did you guys zoom in on it? It's this one. Um, the, you can saute the flowers, and they're sort of, they're, so reportedly, they taste like crunchy mushrooms. I've not tried it yet, but okay. I'm going to. Um, I, I run out of time. This is a busy time of the year for everybody. Sure. Um, but they're bitter. That's, mm -hmm. that's the compound in them. They have vitamins A, B, C, D, iron, potassium, and calcium, and the bitter compounds um, help with digestion. It tells your stomach, hey, <laughs> food's on the way, and get How ready for that? it. So if you uh, want to try dandelion. Okay. You got some in here? Now you may fuss at me. It's that piece right there. Uh, grab that piece. And if you'd like to try, there's a piece sticking out on the oh, edge oh, here. Yes. And it's a little crunchy. Even later, they, they get more bitter, but they're good. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And they, did I say what? Oh, it's Taraxacum officinal. Okay. okay, and by the way, I may be saying the names wrong, right? <laughs> because you've got the school, schooling on this. But as long as I get all the syllables in there, that's good enough. That's all right? that counts. Right? Right? Hey, that's so the way I look at it. Um, all right, Shannon, let's get started with our tea party here. Let's, let's, let's taste all of the things that you have on the table. Wonderful. Um, I've brought. Rosemary cookies, I've brought. Um, I like cookies. That's mm, rosemary man. shortbread <laughs> here. Um, this is from the summer celebration recipe. Oh. This is local honey. Oh, don't tempt me. <laughs> and I chopped up some mint in advance. Oh. And so it's not the prettiest. I would have done this and poured the honey over it, protected it. But this is a, a combination of Vietnamese mint and chocolate mint. Um, so what would y'all like to try? I have uh, nettle pesto. I have cream cheese. Uh, this one has tarragon in it, which is my favorite plant in the universe. Okay. Mexican mint marigold, um, Texas tarragon, Tajitis lucida. This one has rosemary, garlic, and um, a lemon thyme. <laughs> so Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> this is a little plate of wild greens, and um, I can make us some tea. So would y'all like some tea to start with? I can go with sure, tea. Sure. The tea and why are you is, making the tea? I'm going to try some of these cookies right here. Tea is, <laughs> is rosemary and lemon thyme. Would you like me to pass you something? Sure. I'll, yes. Um, Thank you. This is Angela Mulliken's recipe. These, okay. It came oh, from the one of the cookbooks that the Herb Society has. I remember Miss Angela. Um, okay. And if you're a member, you can or come to one of our meetings, you can see about purchasing a cookbook. Uh, to make the rosemary and lemon thyme infusion, all I did is take a quart jar and four to six tablespoons of dried herbs, okay. or six to eight of fresh, and I I'm gonna cover it with hot water. It would be boiling, but it's cooled down enough that I can actually hold it in my hand. So I'm gonna cover it, and I'll let it steep or infuse for uh, 35 to 45 minutes. But this being the magic of TV, I have some already prepared <laughs> in the uh, carafe yeah. for us. You wanna try a little bit of that water? Oh, yes, I'll try a little bit. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody want a plate? And the stinging nettle pesto is made from raw nettles. If you mash, heat, or dry nettles, it takes the sting out. The stinging nettles have needle-like protrusions on the underside of the leaf. Okay. And I just dropped my other gloves. So I'm going to use the back hand. <laughs> that um, has formic acid in it, and that's what causes the sting. That's what oh, okay. causes bee stings and uh, ant stings. Ants, yes. mm -hmm. So when you do that, it removes the formic acid, breaks it up, and lets it dissipate. So if y'all are brave, mm. you can try that. Are you brave, Walter? Yes, I, I, I'll <laughs> Okay, try. Well, let me give you a plate because it's kind of messy. Okay. And while you're doing it, can we talk a little about the cookbooks? Yes. Um, the Memphis Herb Society has put two cookbooks together, Celebration of Herbs, and we've got it. There's an updated one that may not resemble that one any longer, and the Herbal Kitchen. Um, they are recipes that are used by Herb Society members, and so they are always good. Now, um, you're going to be surprised. 
This is very fresh and green. Uh, nettles are, like this. have slight antihistamine properties. Okay. Thank and you. if you'd rather have bread. Oh, I'll take a piece of bread also. Thank you. <laughs> what do you mm. think? It's not bad, though. Uh-huh. It's very fresh, very green. Not bad. I'm not the best pesto maker in the world. It's a little watery. I should have used more nettles. But... Well, I like that's, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. That's, uh -huh. that's pretty good. And, and it's kind of scary because you kind of get that hot feeling, right? That's garlic, raw garlic. So, but, but that's not the formic acid, so you're good. Um, so the stinging nettles are good for gout. Okay. And it's good for anemia. Uh, they've stinging, the nettles have been used to brew beer. And once upon a time, it was considered to make a finer cloth than either cotton or, or linen. Right. So they wow. used it to make cloth. So I think that's kind of cool. Sure. Uh, Thank you for Thank all of you. this uh, wonderful information and all of these things that you could do with weeds. Who knew? Yeah, who knew? <laughs> oh, wow. Who knew? All right, thank you. Up next, Master Gardener Thomas Shure is out in the garden to plant a few warm season vegetables. But first, here are a few gardening events that might interest you. Well, today we're going to start planting uh, tomatoes and pepper plants. The most two common ways of supporting tomato plants is with a tomato stake or post and the cages. In this particular situation, we're going to be using uh, tomato stakes and we're going to plant some tomatoes. One of the plants we got here is, it's in a peat pot. The way I plant them is I remove the very lower leaves. So I have a nice clean stalk and you'll see why in a moment. You just pinch them off. Don't, don't pull them off, pinch them off with your fingernails. The next thing, I'm gonna dig my hole in front of the post. Now with tomatoes, you want them to actually plant them a little bit deeper than uh, they come in the pot. Normally they tell you to plant it at the same depth it was in the pot or a container. We're going to plant them a little bit deeper, and the reason for that is so that the roots that are underground will develop roots, make for a stronger plant. Now that with the peat pot, I tear the peat pot off. That way the plant, uh, roots will have an easier time of spreading. Now that's ready to go in the ground. Do notice that I do have it lower than it was in the peat pot. Now the next thing I like to do is take a little strip of tin foil, about an inch and a half wide, maybe two inches long, and I wrap it around the stem once or twice, just like that, and then I cover it up with uh, soil, leaving part of the tin foil showing above the ground. Just in case you get hit with cutworms, the tin foil prevents the cutworms from cutting down your plant. As the plant grows, it will eventually push the tin foil aside, and by that time, the plant is too big for the cutworms to do any damage. And that's all it is to it. Now, before you plant, you want to make sure it's well hydrated, and after you plant it, then you water the surrounding soil around the plant. We do need to tie the plant when you're staking, and I find that the best thing to use it strips a cloth. It doesn't harm the plant. It has a certain amount of flexibility to it, uh, whereas wires or some of these other devices I have for hooking up the plants uh, get a little wind and they have a tendency to snap the uh, plant with pieces of cloth and you can reuse them year after year. Okay, we're now gonna plant some pepper plants. You prepare them the same way you did with tomatoes. Take the peat pots off, take off the lower leaves and you're gonna plant it a little bit deeper than it was in the container, but not as deep as the tomatoes. So we're digging our hole. It'll be a little bit shallower. We drop it down into it, snug it. Still use a tin foil to prevent cutworm damage.
One of the major differences between staking and caging the plants with tomatoes, you put the stakes in first, as I did, and then you plant the tomatoes. When you're going to cage it, you put the plant in first, and then you put the cage on. Now, these cages are okay for pepper plants, but totally useless for tomato plants. They're too short to support tomatoes when they get a little bit bigger. Well, that's all I have for today, folks. Happy gardening. I hope your, your gardens are beautiful, healthy, and productive. All right, thanks, Tom, for that wonderful information. Walter, we talked about herbs, and we ate some delicious herbs and weeds. Oh, yes. Uh, now let's talk about vegetables, okay? Okay. When is it safe to plant our warm season vegetables? Well, I'll tell you what, Chris. Uh, the date that I always use for myself is April 15th. Okay. Now, there's two reasons <laughs> why right, I use April reasons. 15th. Uh, one, if you uh, go according to the Tennessee Department of Agriculture's um, weather forecasting, uh, they have chosen March 22nd as the date where there's a 50% chance for freeze. All right. So if it's a 50% chance of freeze <laughs> on that date, well, by going to April 15th, well, that's like 24 days after that, so the chances of freeze is pretty much minimized. Okay. And also, being an uh, ag economics teacher, <laughs> there you uh, go. <laughs> April 15th is tax day, yeah, so I can remember it. But that's really the key date that I use is April 15th. April 15th, and it yes. works out pretty well for you. It huh? works out pretty good for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of course, in 2007, uh, you know, we had the late freeze mm -hmm. and everything was kind of, you know, thrown out of whack that year. And that's going to happen occasionally. That's right. That's going to happen sure occasionally. Is. All right. Now, get this question a lot. So why are vegetables identified as cool season or warm season? What's the difference? Okay. Well, well, the big difference is really cold tolerance. Okay. Uh, your, uh, you know, cold season vegetables such as cabbage and all that, they can handle, you know, a little frost. They can handle colder temperatures. But the warm season vegetables cannot. And the general rule of thumb is about 45 degrees, actually 47 degrees. Uh, if a warm season vegetable uh, it spends a lot of time at around 42, 45 degrees, it can stunt their growth. Mm. So therefore, you know, we call them warm season vegetables. And they also require warm weather to germinate, sure. to grow properly, and to produce the food that we want, you know, them to produce. Okay. All right. But it's hot here in the summertime, Sherry, isn't it? It's <laughs> yeah, hot here. So, I mean, how do they withstand the summer heat? Well, you know, botanically, they, the, the group that we call warm season vegetables, they put deep roots. They, okay. They'll put down okay. deep roots, which help draw up moisture. Sure. Uh, that's one thing. And, of course, uh, you know, over the years, uh, the plant breeders have kind of bred heat tolerance into a lot of uh, cultivars and varieties. And that's basically how... They handle these hot mid-south uh, summers. But now it does help to, to go out there and irrigate them, though. I mean, that, that helps them, you know, get, get through some pretty tough weather. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, generally in the summertime, you know, where's the water is what we're asking. That's so. right. Where's yeah. the water? That, you know, that's the big question. Uh, you know, and, hey, the water's over at the faucet. <laughs> it's not going to turn <laughs> All <right>. it off. <laughs> All right. Well, look, what about, uh, let's talk about fertilizing. How should we go about fertilizing our warm season vegetables? Well, you know, we always say on the show, uh -huh. first of all, start with the soil test. Start with the now, soil we, test. You know, we preach that, That's why right. I guess, when you can soil test. That's right. But uh, the main thing that I want people to know about vegetables are that they really like it to be slightly acidic, uh, about a pH of about 6.5. Is uh, that's kind of where they're comfortable. Okay. And also, uh, one thing we have to kind of watch with fertilizing our vegetables is you know, putting too much nitrogen on them. Mm -hmm. uh, and what you'll end up getting is a whole lot of foliage uh, and not a lot of, um, you know, fruit, sure. so to speak. And that's why we always say if you have to side dress nitrogen, uh, wait till after uh, the plants have started fruiting, and after the first fruits, and then do your side dress of nitrogen. Okay. And is that fairly easy to do, side dressing? Oh, yes, okay. that's, that's fairly easy to do. You always want to put it uh, down, you know, near, you know, the, the, the roots there okay. of the plant. Try not to put it up on the leaves because right. it can burn sure. the leaves. Okay. Uh, some other tidbits of information that we need to know about warm season vegetables. Yes. Uh, well, there's actually a couple of things. Um, 
one is I like to see people kind of maybe, uh, you know, rotate mm -hmm. uh, their uh, their garden, so to speak, uh, where you may have had uh, peas or beans last year. Uh, try to put your corn and tomatoes there this year because okay. those legumes have fixed that nitrogen in the soil and, you know, tomatoes and corn are nitrogen lovers. Okay. So they'll be right there to use that. And another little tidbit I like people to remember is with the hot summers that we have, <laughs> yeah. um, plants will th what we call throw off blooms. Okay. So sometimes will. people will call me and they'll say, oh, my blooms are dropping. And I look at the thermometer and it's like 101. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and, and that's yeah. how the plant kind of copes with the heat. Sure. It, it throws off, uh, on, you know, the blooms. Sure. So, so that's some little tidbits there that may help people along the way. Okay. We're talking about one of the vegetables, okay? This is the question we get too. Which one should be transplanted and which one should be started by using a seed? Well, let me say this. Traditionally, okay. it's always been tomato plants and pepper plants okay. that we transplant. But just the other day, I was at a gardening center and I saw where they've already, you know, they're selling uh, sweet corn transplants. You know, and I've really? also seen uh, uh, squash and cucumber transplants. I've seen watermelon. Uh, before. So I think that's kind of becoming the norm, it's so to speak. Yeah. Uh, but um, transplants are good to use because obviously you don't have to deal with any of the germ germination issues. Sure. Um, and also that way you know that the plant is off to a good start. But our temperatures warm up here pretty quick and we have no problem germinating <laughs> seeds at right. all. So, no uh, so there's no problem as you can see with all the weeds. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, there you go. So, so, but like I said, transplants Mainly uh, tomatoes and peppers. Uh, that's kind of the main two that people transplant. And also uh, your sweet potato slips. People right. do tend to transplant those. Okay, thank you for that information there, Walter. Okay, now this is our Q&A session. Okay. Ms. feel free to jump in there if you have something yeah. to say, all right? Here's our first viewer emails from a Mr. Gary. His first question is about nut grass, okay? <laughs> he writes, we have nut grass growing under our blackberry vines. It is choking out the blackberry shoots that come up every year. How can I get rid of it? What do you think about that, Walter? Well, I have blackberries myself. Ah, uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, and I also have <laughs> nut grass. Uh-huh. Uh, and basically, um, what I uh, do, I kind of rig my pump-up sprayer. I have this, like, disposable cup okay. that I kind of force on the end. And I'll just spray uh, glyphosate, okay. and I'll use Roundup, okay. um, just on the nut grass, and it, that kind of protects the uh, blackberry stalks sure. and, I mean, canes, and everything is fine. And that's how I, I do it. Now, he could probably also mix a bucket of, of glyphosate and use an old rag or a brush and yeah. brush it on there. Yeah. But it, and it will take it out, and I think image is another Image is something else that we do that, recommend that, that, that you can doing. use. Uh, yeah. Uh, paintbrush, mm -hmm. you know, dip it in the concentrate, wipe it so you don't have to worry about uh, your desirable blackberry uh, shoots. Uh, you can use a piece of sponge, will work, mm -hmm. uh, will be just fine, and that should get rid of it. But here's the thing about nut grass. It tells you that you have poor drainage. Yes, right? yes. Right. Nut says it's considered the world's worst weed because it actually likes moist conditions that are mm -hmm. wet, but it can actually adapt to drought-like conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, grows by the tuber system. That's right. Uh, and rhizomes. Yes. So if you can't pick it out the ground and you break it right there at the soil surface, you just made it mad. It'll yes. just grow up somewhere else. And, yeah. and I also pull it out also. Yeah, uh, that, yeah make sure you get all of them when you pull it out. Make sure you get all of them. Yeah, because of that tuber system and those rhizomes. So there you have it, Mr. Gary. And your second question is this, and I think we do have time for this last one. How do you get rid of voles in your yard? That's voles <laughs> with a V. What do you okay. think about that one? Well, uh, I like buying those little granules mm -hmm. uh, and just placing them off in the hole, and that usually takes care of the problem. The way to really prevent uh, having the vole problem is keep your mulch down there to three go. inches or less. That's right. And you see people with these volcano type <laughs> there you go. Uh, mulching mm -hmm. jobs, and, and you see these little holes that are about, what, a half a dollar size? Right. Uh, and it's nothing but voles, and, and sometimes dogs and cats are mm -hmm. them up also. But it's usually voles in there, and what's happening is you're giving it a nice hiding place, mm -hmm. a place where it can also feed, because in the fall and winter, uh, those voles actually eat bark and tree mm -hmm. roots. Okay? Right. And not only that, they're herbivores, so they're going to eat herbs, ornamental grasses, yes. 
uh, bulbs, tubers, mm -hmm. your hostas, yes. you know, your expensive yes. hostas. They're going <laughs> to eat those things. But something uh, that I thought was pretty neat about bulbs is this. Um, they actually have, the female has five to ten litters per year. Wow. Okay. Litter wow. size ranges from three to six young. But get this, wow. they seldom live longer than 12 months. Huh. So get that. So they're efficient. <laughs> really good. All right, well that's all the time we have for today. Don't forget, you can send a letter or email with your gardening questions. I'm Chris Cooper, thanks for watching, and be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South, is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center, in Germantown since 1943, and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants, plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.